Hello, my name is Kyle Cherick, and this is the Madison College Chef Demo Series presented by Volrath. And I am here with Chef Philip Foss of L Ideas. Chef, proprietor, owner, creator, and now author of L, uh, Life in L, your uh, graphic novel that you wrote with your cousin Tim. Um, we're going to get to that in a minute. Sure. But before we get to that, uh, I don't get to, well, I hang out with a lot of chefs, but I don't get to hang out with that many chefs that have a Michelin star back at their place. So how, why, when, and what's it like to have that hanging over your, um, you know, you know, every day you get up, yeah. Right. You know, the, when we first opened L, I mean, I de definitely had Michelin star aspirations for it. Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me begin by saying thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be with you guys for this series. And thank you to Bullrath for bringing me here. Uh, but what it, it means, it, it just, it's a great honor and it, it feels great to be in this really select group of restaurants in Chicago mm -hmm. that have a Michelin star. You know, but at the same point, you know, like we've always just kind of done what we do and it, you know, really shouldn't be about accolades and uh, striving for that. You know, it should just be about yeah. doing the best you can. Yeah, it should be. Right. But, and it is for your cooking, but it's, I mean, everybody knows it's also about so much more. You, you, it's, it's the other side, it seems that the star is like, well, you, you maybe even never wanted one, but once you have one, you know, you know, it's... Well, I wanted one. Yeah. But the problem was is that once I had one, then I wanted two. Right. You know, and then all of a sudden it came to be this thing is like, what am I striving for really? Am I ever going to be satisfied? And, you know, the answer I came up with was no. Yeah. You know, so let's just stick to just doing what we do. And that's just trying to make fine dining fun and, you know, take the pretentiousness out of the situation and just replace it with like a fun, interactive environment. So you fell into fine dining for your own restaurant uh, in a really unusual way. And it's, we have a mutual friend through Justin mm -hmm. Carlisle, and then we have some other mutual friends, and we're both boys from Milwaukee, so we've right. got that. And it was a pleasure, just as we were walking into the room before we sat down in front of the cameras, to be talking about some places and how they've changed and not have to translate to somebody, because you're like, I know that straight. Milwaukeeans speak their own yeah, language, yeah. to be sure. Yeah, I know, I know that corner, I know that bar. Um, which there are a bajillion of in Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, just yeah, too yeah. many, yeah. Um, my, my, my real question was, or my, I guess not question, but how you got to L was really almost happenstance because you had this food truck, right. which you had to get uh, the powers that be in Chicago to change the laws. And right. you and, I forget the other guy. Uh, Matt Maroney. Matt Maroney, yeah. yeah, went up against the city. We did. To change these onerous laws, which now we all take for granted in every city. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And uh, Chicago was very restrictive towards it. Yeah. You know, they had good reasons for it because there used to be battles on the street between food carts. It wasn't even like gourmet food trucks, really. Okay. And uh, they had to take those means to protect stop the fights but yeah. you know when it came around for time for gourmet food trucks to hit the scene the 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 restrictions were so prohibitive that it yeah. was very anti-competitive and you know we took it up with some aldermen to make some changes and we actually got a new ordinance put in now doesn't hasn't really taken away most of the challenges but it was a step in the right direction well it sort of opened up to i mean it was like the the it lit the fire then other trucks are saying okay hey there's a chance and we can do this and right you know uh if chicago politics is known for anything um its enforcement is somewhat conditional based on the situation this is true. I'm not going to sit and like talk smack about <laughs> no, no. my city's politics, but it'd be very easy to do that. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I think that I think the one thing, the biggest argument against food trucks for restaurants was that they take away business from restaurants. But you know, as somebody who went from a food truck into a restaurant right. and you know now owns a restaurant, I can tell you firsthand that I'd much rather have a restaurant than a food truck. So if anybody has a hard competitive a hard place to, to compete, it's mm -hmm. a food truck. Hmm. Um, yeah. But everybody has their own, is entitled to their own feelings on that. And I know people are very, people are very passionate about that subject. And people are very passionate about their food trucks. Uh, food in general brings out passion. So you get a kitchen, a commissary kitchen, in a, uh, what we would have affectionately then called a blighted neighborhood. That's correct. And the inspector says, I don't know how to license this. 
but since there's room for dining over there, I'm just going to call it a restaurant. That's... And you, Philip Foss, say, oh, I now own a restaurant. It really, that is exactly <laughs> how it went down, yeah. and it may be the greatest thing that ever came out of a health inspection at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, but that is exactly, it was like lightning striking me, and I was like, my God, why didn't I not think about this before? But, yeah. you know, that's just the way things happen. So but how long had you been in the space, in and out, day to day, just, you know, cleaning it up or cooking in there before, uh, how many times before this health inspector said, Oh, by the way, that's Excalibur right there. That's not just any old sword. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. It was, uh, I mean, we were working in it for nine months. You know, I Whoa. would wake up and then, you know, get ready for the food truck at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'd wake up and, you know, there were nights where I'd sleep on the floor on a cardboard table propped on the floor. And, you know, it was a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the weird thing is, is that I, I don't think L would have ever materialized in the way it did had I not gone through that like edifying kind yeah of, you know yeah. it, was, it was throwing it all it was a, you know, abandoned to the wind you know because yeah. you know it was pretty much i had two little babies at that time and it was you know making ends meet because i had just come out of a great paying hotel job yeah you know it was really yeah. uh it was the challenge of my life in a lot of ways and it it uh, to get personal it, it cost you your marriage Yes. And well, it helped to cause my, it, it helped it to helped break out my you. marriage. You sure. can't blame it all on that. It wasn't you know? just that your first wife didn't like meatballs. No, she yeah. was actually involved with the business. Right, right, right. yeah. So right. It, it, but it, so it was sort of the sauce that broke the camel's back. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, which um, plays into your much greater story, but um, I want to talk, I want to like pivot back to sort of equipment and technical stuff. Sure. You've worked in some of the finest restaurants in America, mm -hmm. Le Cirque being the, the name that everyone would know. Right. Um, and five years there, not like some people said, oh, well, I spent a summer or I stodged or something. Five years, right. longer than a presidential term. <laughs> you saw a lot of people come and go. You worked for great chefs. Right. Uh, I think you were there when I was there as a customer who had to borrow a sport coat. I thought you looked familiar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just to get in. We'll talk about that later. Um, and, and anyway, so you worked for and then Lockwood and Chicago and things like that, but you also took this path where you basically just went into large amounts of food put out through big institutions like Better Hotels. Mm -hmm. And when food writers fill their byline, they love to say, oh, chef worked here and worked here and worked here and worked here. You didn't exactly work at sexy places for a while there. But, That's what, but true. What, did that, what, did that, what did that do for your soul? What did that teach you? Right. What equipment did that turn you on to? Were you like, oh, you know what? It's a hell of a lot easier to make these delicate amuse bouches when I have this massive mixer or, you know, whatever, whatever that right. translation might be. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, as, a, as far as a, a Volrath product that really did help out in the beginning of opening up the Meaty Balls Mobile, were there big... Can you uh, say, sorry, Meaty, Meaty Balls Mobile? The Meaty Balls Mobile was the name of the food truck. Our <laughs> mission statement was to get our balls in the mouth of every Chicagoan. Uh-huh, uh -huh. you know, We didn't fail, we didn't succeed at that, but one, our balls might see the light of day again one sure. someday. But sure. Anyhow, um, what we did, what we used was a, <laughs> in, like these Swiss Army pans, like the, they're like square, they come with a cover, they're very heavy duty. And we used to put, we used to like smoke pork shoulders and then we'd put them in these pans and we'd braise them overnight. Okay. And then the next day we would take the, the pork shoulders, smoke pork shoulder out and we would actually cook our meatballs in the broth that, oh, so yeah. it was like this constant revolution of these uh, Volrath pans being in constant use. And, you know, the, the amount of production that they yeah. kind of constantly beat out, they bit, fit perfectly on our six burner, two of them fit perfectly on our six burner stove. It so you had like uh, the chef hack, but you had to have the right equipment. Otherwise you would have been done. I, I kind of resent the term hack, but. Okay, okay, I apologize. <laughs> you, an this, artist of chaos. You, okay, you had this chef inventive moment of creativity. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and uh, it's, but, there, it's the same thing. Yeah, but it's, I mean, like, like you're a mountain climber, you don't have the right cramp out, like you're done. You can't, yeah. you just can't execute that move or whatever would be a comparable metaphor. You gotta make it happen, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like a basketball player going to the hole. You just you right. can't see failure. Just yeah. have to make it happen. Yeah, and I never had uh, your meaty balls, but um, uh, <laughs> several friends told me that the sweaty ball was kind of legendary. 
and yeah. worth standing in line for 20 minutes when it was really cold. Yeah. Yeah, just for that. I mean, you had a major following. People came all over the place for my sweaty balls. <laughs> So, moving on to L Ideas, and uh, I've never met a chef more steeped in puns, by the way. Thank that, you. That or loves I think. it. Yeah, <laughs> that loves it for his enterprises. Not as a joke later that night over drinks, but like, no, you actually do it. It's on. It's on the T-shirt. It's yeah. on the name. It's on the side of the van or truck, as it would be. So, um, L Ideas, you're under an L. Right. But there's so much more to it than that. Well, yeah, it, the, the name itself is an acronym for Elevated Ideas in Dining. And it really, when I conceived it, before I even thought about what else it could be, I always felt like it was going to be this like, kind of beacon for the community, you know, for artists of all kinds to be able to showcase their stuff. And you know, even the way we developed at L as, uh, as a restaurant, we, it's a cl very collaborative spirit. Mm -hmm. We don't have any walls in the restaurant, so guests are allowed to, allowed to get up out of their chairs and come back to the kitchen and hang out with us. My chefs interact with them quite a bit, and they, as a result, you know, because I saw that they've got this investment and I felt it would be a good place for them to show off their own skills. So chefs actually come up with their own dishes at the restaurant and they tell the dining room about them. So they really get interaction, not just within with, in developing their cuisine, but they learn how to interact with guests, yeah. which is something that so many chefs take for granted, Right. you know, is the people skills, you know, we, most of us, Go into kitchens to hide and oh no question yeah you're i mean as another chef said i don't play well with others and right. that's why i went into cooking it, and I, I learned that i didn't play well with others either so i think through working with uh you know with the chefs at the restaurant and collaborating with them it kind of helped me to be in a good place to be able to collaborate with my cousin yeah. you know tim foss on working on our comic book and mm -hmm. you know so much about happiness i think is about your collaboration with others whether it's relationships or you know, as a restaurateur, we collaborate with our guests to make an evening mm -hmm. successful. But, you know, people love the idea of connecting and, you know, through food and dining is, you know, certainly the best yeah. way to do that. And to kind of get back to your question about, you know, what those travels and, you know, like mm -hmm. there was a period of my time where I stepped away from fine dining and went and I worked around hotels and it was, you know, I, I felt like I went through this five year, seven year phase of learning how to become a chef in New York City and working at Le Cirque. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I really kind of disappeared and just was willing to take kind of any job I could get for the idea of being able to travel and uh, see other cultures. It's a bit of a quest in a way. It became that. Yeah. It, you know, I wanted to, it became about escapism and running away. Yeah. And, and, you know, and what I learned later, you know, later in my life, I was running away from a lot of things I didn't want to look at. And, sure, you sure. know, at the end of the day. But yeah, I feel that. But yeah, and you ran far. I mean, you went to the King David uh, in, in Israel. You went to um, Brazil, Brazil, you know. Yeah, you went to Hawaii. I mean, you didn't you didn't go to like the Hilton and, you know, down the street in Chicago and just sort of disappear off of social media. You, you actually went far. One of the great things about being a chef is, you know, no matter where you go, if you know how to cook, you're going to be able to find a job, job and somebody to cook for. And it might not always be the job that you're looking for. And yeah. a lot of times it's not, but you know, as long as you kind of have your priorities in order, which for me at the time was to live life and not, be so chained to mm -hmm. the kitchen and chained to fine dining and chained to the career. Yeah. You know, because we only have our youth once and it's important to go out and experience the world if you can. Yeah. So did you bring skills and actual pra practical application from those jobs back into the food truck or L or was it more an ethos and a, and a way of thinking about kitchens and how things can be done per the example that you you just gave with the braised right. shoulder and things like that. It is a lot about an ethos towards being, you know, very risk adverse towards living life yeah. first. Yeah. And that in itself, I think, translates into, well, 
the food truck, the having the the, the courage really to right. launch a food truck to when launch, no one else was doing right. them. when it was illegal. Yeah, and basically. even L, like if if anybody were to give me a business plan for what L Ideas is and ask yeah. me if I want to invest it, I'd say you're out of your mind. This isn't going to work. And yet, and yet, and yet, uh, Eater, uh, which was well, and yet Eater called you. Uh, well, basically. The, the quote was, said, no one else in America is cooking food like Philip Foss at L Ideas. It was, it blew me away. I almost dropped sure. like my iPad when uh, yeah. I saw it because yeah. it was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. did they really just say that? But it's it's true. And my old late friend, Josh Erzerski, thought you were the most meaningful thing happening in Chicago. I remember Josh is a good, Josh yeah, a dear, a great, yeah. dear friend. And, and uh, I remember him, yeah. he, you know, I mean, for, for someone like that who had just taken on the helm uh, what well, had been the food editor for um, for New York Magazine, and then taken on the helm for Esquire mm-hmm. uh, to have that kind of perspective. I mean, there's there's somebody who ate everywhere without worrying about the check, mm-hmm. so he could eat adventurously yeah. um, and loved food <laughs> to 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 his detriment in a way. Anyway, mm-hmm. yes. so you so you transition from food truck to restaurant. I want to get back to collaboration because that's so key, and what you were doing and still doing is so unique. But um, talk about what you used. Like you're, a, you're a hands-on guy. This is a mechanics shirt right. that says L Ideas. Yeah. So you're very hands-on uh, in the style of your food. Well, in the in the way that you make your customers eat or suggest they do. You don't make them do anything. Yeah. I think uh, all those years working at the hotel got me kind of tired of wearing the old traditional chef whites and Mm -hmm. there was really nothing traditional about L and it wasn't white collar, it certainly was blue collar. So felt like we were going to own that through and through. So yeah, yeah, this was our first uh, jersey and it kind of speaks to the fact, you know, like we don't have any prep cooks in our kitchen. So I, I come in, I do my dishes, I'm peeling the garlic for it, slicing the onions. And, you know, like it, it gives us so much more of the, well, I guess the uh, signature on the food. It really is kind of a workhorse mentality to yeah. it. But, you know, also, we, I, I, you know, I've made a very strong effort to try to make the restaurant life easy on the psyche as well. Mm-hmm. Because it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's such a hard business, you know, to be able to maintain uh, balance throughout a uh, life, especially with relationships. And, yeah, it's just uh, the whole package. Yeah. So you're, and you live upstairs. Do it differently has always been my model. <laughs> so you, you live upstairs and you come down and right. then each of your cooks, yourself included, is empowered to cook those dishes. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always thought there was so this comparable aspect to, for chefs. Uh, Japanese poetry has got this concept that you only ever really write eight poems. Mm-hmm. You just keep rewriting them. That's a great... Isn't that beautiful? Yes, yeah. Yes. And I've learned observing chefs that through the years, though they may vary on their dishes, they're, they're really, they're using a core group of um, techniques, equipment, styles that they keep going back to. It's very that's, observant. That's, it's really observant, yeah. uh, Kyle, for sure. So what are those for you? Like, what are those things? And I know how varied and inventive sure. L might be, but you know, like what, wh- give me the eight poems, Philip. You know, <laughs> the eight poems, that's that's a hard one to do, you know, for sure. But I think if you like, and I think for me, I like to use the analogy of a musician, mm-hmm. you know, like you have, you, like I learned how to cook basically at Le Cirque, you know, yeah. so that was, that's really like the roots and the foundation of my music. Let's say like Bob Dylan, his roots is in Woody Guthrie and, and yeah. in the yeah. and in uh, folk music, right? right. And then so a little I learned, Robert Johnson so I, thrown I, in. Like my first dishes when I first broke off as a chef, they really were just like small variations from mm-hmm. the food that I grew up with. But slowly, as I started to gain more confidence and you know build up more of a repertoire with my own dishes, mm-hmm. you know, then I became ready to break into the electrical guitar, like, you know, like go off and right. actually create a genre that isn't necessarily there before, yeah. you know, and it, it, but that actually happened more through storytelling than actual, like, and thinking more about what it is about food that, that gets us to connect to food, Yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and, and through that, 
Yeah, I've got like a set of like almost if you look at my whole repertoire, it's just a bunch of mishmash of the same thing mixed in a hundred different ways. Right, right. So if someone took your microplane away, for instance, would that be the thing where you're like, no, 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 no. Okay, and now I'm I'm actually down one hand or something. Good, you know what I mean? Good point. If there's, yeah. if, there, if there's one thing that would be one or three or something like that, but I'm I, I'm always curious with chefs like what is your you know that that final scene you in know, the jerk where he's like I'm, I'm fine. A, I just, a, <laughs> a good old fashioned sizzler plate, you know, or like a little steak plate like that has so many different uses from yeah. you know like crushing peppercorns on the back of a you know so like you know like I think as a chef you know we're kind of taught to get along, make it happen no matter right. what. So oh, yeah, like. I feel like I can create on the fly, but like I'd be really lost without my steak pan. Interesting, yeah, cool, cool. So back to collaboration, because if uh, when one comes in as a diner to L, uh, it's a comp first of all, it's, it's prefix, so that's that's the story. Right, everybody you, pays before they come in. Yep. There's no choice on the menu. Yep. You get what we give you. You're gonna sit with either it. friends that made the Take reservation, or, it, yeah. or you're gonna sit with strangers. Yeah, we don't have no shows because everybody's paid up front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or if they do, you still got the we money. We sell the money, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Doesn't happen often. <laughs> um, so you're sitting with either friends or work colleagues or, or strangers, mm -hmm. and then the courses come out, and, and uh, you all sort of present, pontificate, preach, teach, mm -hmm. educate, sing, uh, soliloquy right. each course, right. depending on uh, the tone and tenor. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, that in and of itself is a very human collaboration with, I almost said the audience, but with the, with the guests, That's right? That's exactly kind of the, the basis for where my style of cooking really kind of veered off into its own is that, you know, at L Ideas, we have this unique connection with the guest. Like mm -hmm. we have nothing blocking us. Like in a normal restaurant, a server has to explain the dish to a guest. Yeah. And like, like it's like when you tell a secret across the room, it's going to be something else by the time it gets in front of that person. It's like a game of telephone. Right. And I think even yeah. Harvard did like a study about this, about being able to see the person cooking your food. Hmm. You know, like when you can actually see what them preparing it and mm -hmm. in our case, even describing it, they, it there, there's just a stronger connection to what it is in front of them. And, right. and that's really what, you know, so much of art and so much about certainly the restaurant experience is about is the strengthening of, you know, the forming of those connections. And, yeah, yeah. You know, we do it, you know, we get the ingredients to us and there's, you know, like what's a story between before those ingredients where the farmers that it went mm -hmm. to, the purveyors that it went to, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what happened to it before it got to us. And then we have this opportunity to turn it into something more, to elevate it, getting yeah. back to the elevating of it. for us now, we have to create a story behind it. And right. like if we can create a linear path where we're connecting dots, you know, like by the time a person's eating it, they can taste the care that goes into it. Yeah. And I think that is the goal of the chef is to just make those steps, you know, like full of care. Yeah, I like it. And you're, you're, I mean, your name, the name of the restaurant uh, and the cuisine are constantly collaborating, it seems to me, with the environment around. Like, you can hear the train. You can't yeah. miss the L train. Like, you know, it's not. Uh, it's actually a freight train out there. The L, it does not oh, really? pass near us, actually. Okay. But, like, all the places. All the same, you hear a train. All the places I've lived in my life, and I'm interrupting you, but yeah. all the places I've lived in my life have really been close to trains. Like, I can hear them passing by. So, it's really cathartic for me personally. Interesting. And there's so much about trains that, you know, correlate to connecting our country. Yeah. You know, and our history is so richly tied through it for better and for worse, mm -hmm. you know, because much of the decimation of Native American population and Buffalo was on account of trains and yeah. you know so there's a dual duality to it but mostly there's just something very romantic I find something really romantic about it and yeah. you know, something that actually translates Centering. into our dining experience even so you're Elle's always lived uh, it seems to me at sort of the crossroads within Chicago dining which is I think the most evocative and, and provocative city in American dining it has been for a while now, but so you've got you got the molecular angle of uh, what Grant does at mm -hmm. Linea, and then previously at Moto, and you know that sort of right. world. Um, and then you had the the access kind of um, angle that uh, Jacob 
Bill, uh, uh, Picklehop right. did with the 42 grams, and you were doing it in joies, that sort of way. And you were this nice crossroads where it was right. like, well, it's not going to be as removed, and we're not going to have you know vanilla flavored balloons that were inhaling for dinner right. as as a intermezzo or whatever. But uh, we're also um, it's not low down comfort food. It's not that sort of thing. But there's some aspects, a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, there's a certain irreverence, but there's also a certain amount of presentation. Uh, like, how did you, how do you negotiate all of that with a restaurant that's now been a really healthy, ongoing concern? You're coming up on 10 years. Yeah, we are. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's been a roller coaster ride for sure, and I'm not gonna lie, I feel like right now we've kind of blending into the walls a little bit in the Chicago scene and mm. a lot about our comic book came out of that energy of, mm -hmm. you know, like here we are. We're still like, here. I don't want to go down, like <laughs> I'm not ready to go down that path of irrelevance yet, you Gently know. Gently into that good night. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I won't go quietly anyway. And uh, yeah. so we did the comic, but at the same point, you know, like it's because of a restaurant like Alinea and what Grant is doing and before him what Charlie Trotter did in Chicago sure. and even before that what Jean Bonchet was yeah. doing here. Yeah. And 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 then you look at well, Grant right now, and you know, he is definitely in the top echelon. You know, the first time I ate at Alinea, I came back and I was like Oh no, what I've been doing is not right. going to be that I, doesn't matter anymore. I know nothing. Throw that yeah, out the yeah. window, you know, and it was so, so so because he's pushing the boundaries like that in a yeah. way forced me to reevaluate what I was doing. And for me, I, I don't feel like I can create food on that, you know, plateau. So I've decided to find like a niche with the style of service and you know, our our whole approach to the restaurant uh theme and yeah you know and to kind of look at that differently and to inject my personality mm -hmm. more than maybe my cooking style so you have a comic book we you do. have a yeah. a gothic or graphic novel graphic not a gothic novel. not a gothic it's a little novel. dark yeah no there are those moments it's true um so you're just going along you're recovering your 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 staff told you you got some anger issues your life is i mean you started meditating i'll let you tell that story but yep. In the midst of it, you run into a cousin, yep. and it's like, because this makes sense. Dude, let's do a graphic novel together. My life's really interesting, I'm sure, for everybody, and you draw really well. It was what his. The? It was my cousin's idea. Okay. We we started catching up at a family reunion of all things. So the next time you go and crap on it when your parents invite you to it, <laughs> realize that's some good thing. It's kind of like a health inspection. <laughs> right, you know, right. like once in a blue moon, something good can that's come sort out of, of a it. Right? Theme <laughs> for your life, you should probably hit up the DMV for your it next kinda, career move. It kind of is, yeah. you know, in a lot of yeah. ways. How ridiculous <laughs> a con more ridiculous a concept, the better a chance of success. Right. So this graphic novel that you've written mm -hmm. with Tim. I mean, how. <laughs> this is a weird pivot, okay? Right. I'm just gonna put it out there. Right. Yeah. So it came about out of, I'd been working on a, a, a memoir and it was getting really long and I was at this family reunion and talking with Tim and we were catching up a little bit mm -hmm. and I told him about it and he just kind of had spoken that he had been studying comic art and he just kind of, we mentioned, wouldn't it be fun if we did that? And I think it was a couple of weeks later, he texted me back and he's like, hey, you want to still talk about this? And little by little, we started talking about it and then it yeah. started developing. And, you know, little by little, it kind of became just, this thing that was bigger than both of us in a way. And, right. you know, I, right. yeah. So, but he's in a different city. He's in Minneapolis. Correct. You're in Chicago. Right. Um, you were talking about collaboration before. Like when I collaborate with people, I generally like to have some close proximity right. from time to time. So how do you n navigate something that's so personal? Uh, uh, some versions of your life story, right. and uh, I mean, it's a very physical style of creation that he does. Right. So how do you like how do you do that without standing over each other's shoulders? It was a lot of trust in the process to be real, mm. and it was about a lot of communication and a lot of connecting and a lot of phone calls and text messages and actually learning about each other's lives that I think yeah, made the telling of this story so much more rich, you know, because I, I found parallels. We, we had different art forms for sure, mm -hmm. but you know, like there, were, there was a common thread to I think anybody, any artist, and I think we were able to tap into that. 
and then open it up and kind of see, you know, let the story come out of that. And, you know, the one good thing about being a chef, well, there's a lot of great things about being a chef, but the stories that we're able to see and the people we meet and the, yeah. you know, the walks of life that we come into contact with is, is, is tremendous, you know, and it's, it gives you opportunity to touch people's lives in, in just a very profound and, you know, people love being, eating good food, you yeah, know, and yeah. as a chef to be able to just do that, you know, and being able to, well, work hard for sure, but, you know, being able to nurture other people. I mean, that's one of the amazing things about the industry. There's, there's some, you can live on that razor's edge and the work and things like that can really grind a person down, but the community, the camaraderie, the authenticity, the way you can change people's lives through cooking, not just through the food that they've eaten, mm -hmm. but being a leader, giving them a place to grow in their creativity and then saying, and you probably have to some of your uh, chefs, I think it's time for you to go here and take no. the craft, no? No. No. No, I like people, I, I don't like people leaving me, I never have, but <laughs> you know, like at the same point, you know, I totally understand that people need to move on. Yeah. And you know, I, I was a very lone soldier as a chef, I didn't have anybody opening doors for me, you mm -hmm. know, like I had to push down every door that mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. I came in front of and I, and I feel, I think as a result of that, that's what I feel like other chefs should do. If a chef wants to push down a door and come to me and learn, Interesting. you know, and if and if chef wants says that I've learned enough, it's time for me to move on and go somewhere else. Yeah. I, all the luck, you know, good luck. I, I do yeah. wish you the best. I don't hold grudges yeah. to people for leaving, but at the same time, you know, I think it's important for everybody to go find their own. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So you're you're working on this book with Tim, and you're. Like, were there times where you just said, N that's, not, that's not how I see it in my mind? Just like designing a dish. This is, yeah, this is actually very easy for me to answer that question. There was a point, you know, there's a really hard point in this story where Tim and I were kind of not stuck, but it, I just knew I had to get this out. Mm -hmm. And it was gonna be really hard and really cause a lot, you know, I'm gonna, really gonna have to go deep into myself to get it out. Yeah, but and it was I wrote it out, it was vital. And it, you know, as soon as Tim saw it, I was like, yes, that's what, I needed to see and that's the direction direction we need to take this and then when it came time for him to draw it he completely kind of left out the the dialogue that I did and he completely took this story kind of out of the not just out of the scene it was like a completely different place and when I first saw it I was like what do you what yeah. is this this yeah. is not at anything right right and and he's like I just felt like I had to take this and you know I just I kind of we hung up the phone and I was talking with my wife who got you know is an incredible backbone that yeah. has allowed this to happen in a lot of ways and you know she I was like he what's he doing he's taking this the wrong way and and she's I'm like but I realized you know like at L like I don't tell chefs what to cook you know, she kind of helped me to see this. Mm. Like you collaborate, you know, you, like you don't tell your cooks what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what, you're right. And I let him go. And the strangest thing about it is like, even though my words were completely lost, like his drawings capture the words in a more profound way. And it is now my favorite part <laughs> of the entire book because it actually Couple means, of different like languages. I have my own interpretations sure. of those pages that have nothing to do with my writing in a way. Yeah. So I know so pretty much every chef has said to me, come to my restaurant, let me cook for you, you'll know me through my food. Yeah. Did Tim come to the restaurant either before, middle, or after the book? The middle. Middle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It is Why interesting. The middle? You know, it, I think it was that was a lot to do with the distance, okay. you know, between us for sure. Yeah. Um, it was. I believe it was the middle that he came for and. I think it was also to just to kind of reinforce what we were doing and to yeah. give a little bit more of a background. Seeing it as, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And yeah. I mean, that kind of goes to why I did a graphic novel and comic instead of a memoir, mm -hmm. you know, get to the point faster. And yeah. well, my cooking is about me, but I, what I really knew at the end of the day was that there was a whole side of me that nobody gets to see, yeah. you know, and I, All I think- of us. Right, and exactly, and I think I was, you know, through Tim's drawings, I was able to get that out in the story and in yeah. the comic, and 
You know, it isn't so pretty at all times, but it, good intentions. Well, your hero, one of your heroes uh, is Jean-Louis Peladin, mm -hmm. who is one of my heroes. Uh, I'm not a chef, mm -hmm. but everything that he stood for and that he did, and I would trade some other people who died later in life for more years of Jean-Louis's life mm -hmm. continuing forward, right. if only for what it would mean to American dining. So I felt a kinship with you in that book. Um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Jean-Louis was a master and you know it really became him in a lot of ways because I remember talking about him with a young chef and the chef didn't know who he was and I'm like oh my gosh right that's, yeah. that's exactly how I felt about yeah. it and then when I started thinking about him and like drawing parallels between myself and him well you know anger issues are a very easy place for a chef to start with drawing parallels to other chefs and mm -hmm. you know he had this huge passion for white truffles a story of his that I remember hearing when I was in New York City was him coming back from a vacation you know seeing that truffle oil was used on a dish and walking the entire restaurant staff out to the back alley and he took the bottle and smashed it against the wall into a gazillion pieces and you know and when I heard this story, I was like, oh, that's a legend. That's who I need to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he was this hero that was larger than life. And, know you know, and yeah. well, we tied a white truffle goddess into the comic as well as a result of, uh, yeah. you know, the kinship and, the, you know, like chefs worship truffles as mm -hmm. if they're like this otherworldly thing. So, yeah, yeah. Kind of tied everything together in the end. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely book that is not particularly lovely, but it's worthwhile for anybody in the culinary sphere to read because it's a window into um, more real that goes on. Uh, yeah. In my role, I've had the opportunity to stand just not quite in the corner of the kitchen, but off to the left mm -hmm. and uh, just observe, just soak it in. Right. Yeah, but never be asked, why is he here? And the things that you see, you, it's very true in your book. The intensity. There's tons yeah. and tons of intensity and machismo and yeah. testosterone and the girl. If there are girls in the kitchen who manage to survive, they're usually the toughest people there. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think there's a degree where we nurture diners and we have a great sense of nurturing others with food, but then we don't really nurture ourselves and, you know, we're really not very nurturable, you know, we're kind of like jerks. Because ah, that's not true about everybody. So what's exciting to you about uh, L Ideas right now? What are you putting out or what do you see coming? Now that you birthed this book, right? Right. And, but still, it's service every night, well, Tuesday through right. through Saturday. So like, what's, what's the drive now or what are you looking? Honestly, the drive very much is just about getting the message across about this book and about what the book has opened up in me. And, you know, I want to be, for the rest of my life, I'd rather be known more for my words and about my, than for my food. But I feel like if I'm able to focus on my words and my narrative and the story, you know, I mm -hmm. feel like my food will take care of itself because I've been doing it for so long. I don't, you know, yeah. I feel like the less I actually think about it and put into it, the more precise in a weird way the dishes are coming out now. It's, it's, it's been very uh, moving. If you talk about that, if you pursue that from a place of humility, it makes perfect sense. If you pursue what you just said from a place of ego, everyone will tell you you're gonna crash and burn. It's a really good way of looking at it, Kyle. And yeah. uh, you know, it is the ego, a chef's ego is about as big as they get, you know? And you know, just taking a little bit of air out of my own ego has been made a world of difference in regards to you know, my appreciation of what I do. Mm -hmm.